Chester, right? Yes. Uh, just just wait. In three minutes, we will make it live stream. Like, uh, let me talk to Anrudh quickly. Yes, still we have some minute. <coughs> so. Yeah, in three minutes, yeah. uh, let's start. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good, good, good. So we, you are at the, like in the middle of your PhD, beginning of your PhD or at the final stage? Uh, almost at the final stage. Like uh, okay, right now, good. I'm in my fifth year now. Okay, okay. Yeah. In a few nice. months, I should be done. Okay, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you're working with Professor Thakur? No, no, I'm working with uh, Professor Alex, Alex Yesovich. Okay. He's, he works in Combinatrix. Uh, okay, so you are working on discrete mathematics. Discrete yeah. mathematics, yeah. Okay, nice, yeah. So finite fields, uh, Fourier transforms, those kinds yeah. of things and counting. Yeah. So yeah. mostly like a little bit between group theory and number theory? A uh, little bit of, not a lot of number theory. Uh, it's mostly like uh, counting configurations of various graphs inside I see. finite I see. dimensional so, spaces. Baba's, Baba's type of stuff. Little bit exactly. So you're, yeah. Okay, nice. nice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'll try to share. Okay, we we you. we still have two minutes. So yeah, now it's a uh, time share for slides, you to take it. Yeah. Anirudh. Yeah. Share the slides. Yeah. Yeah. So here. Yeah. Here. I hope you can see them clearly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Present a slideshow there. Okay, whenever you're ready, uh, we can start the topic. It's not going to be a long, yeah. it's going to be a short. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. Whatever you want to tell us, we will be happy to hear. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. First of all, thanks a lot for uh, uh, giving me the opportunity to speak about something. And yeah. this is a really fantastic topic. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, I read the paper and it was uh, a beautiful technique. That, yes. Um, yeah. I'm just curious to at the end to uh, get the punchline what you're making. Model is as easy as ABC. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So here it is actually. Um, uh, at the bottom, I have written that. Uh, okay, so uh, if you want to know the page number or slide number, you can see on the left side, bottom, uh, so that you know the progress of how much uh, we are into. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. We can, we can. Okay, actually, the officially, like, uh, uh, Devind, could you see on, could you glance on the YouTube link and you see that if uh, the people are still joining there or I should go ahead now? Wait a minute. <coughs> Sorry. What is that? Like I'm listening myself. Uh, I, I think the, the, there's a small delay in what we are saying and what, what's being played at the, the ah, other. Okay. Because I'm I'm listening you exactly at the right time. Yeah, when you're speaking. Yeah. I see. I okay. See. Yeah. So welcome everyone uh, for the last session of our main lecture series of the first trimester program of a year long activity. And we are happy to have Anirudh Gurjale from University of Rochester, who is at the final stage of his graduate studies. And he is going to tell us or convince us that how easy it is that uh, ABC implies model, right? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so the topic is uh, ABC implies model. This is actually a paper by Noam Elkis that I'll be presenting on. Okay, so first things first. <clears throat> Louis Model made a conjecture in 1922. And what he says is that given any curve of genus greater than or equal to 2 over the field of rational numbers has only finitely many rational points. What does that mean? So what he's trying to say is, if you have an equation f of x comma y equals zero, and you you let's say you have okay, it's defined over q, 
meaning the coefficients of f of x comma y are rational numbers. So it could be something like y square equal to x power 5 minus 7x plus 3, something like that. It, it can be any um, curve. So suppose it's non-singular and all of that. So if you have a curve for which you can define a genus, um, and suppose that genus is greater than or equal to 2, then you cannot have infinitely many rational points. It was a surprise. I mean, for genus equal to 0 and genus equal to 1, uh, it was known that there are cases where there are infinitely many solutions and all the higher genera uh, just fall into one category. It says that there are only finitely many rational points. And the, the, the topic, uh, the, the point of this presentation is that I'll convince you that if it happens to have infinitely many rational points, then it would contradict ABC. That, that is the kind of approach uh, uh, Noam Elkis has taken. Okay. And of course, this conjecture was slowly generalized by replacing Q by an arbitrary number field. So uh, for an arbitrary number field, you would say that if, uh, if the curve is defined by an equation where all the coefficients are um, in a number field K, then if you ask how many K rational points exist, then turns out there are only finitely many. That's the conjecture. And of course, it's no longer a conjecture anymore. It's called Faulting's theorem. It was proved by Gerd Faulting's in 1983. And you might actually notice the S apostrophe S. Uh, I found that interesting. And wherever I looked down uh, over the internet, it was always the spelling. Faulting's theorem. Okay. <laughs> um, so Noam Elkis gives a conditional proof, actually. Uh, of this conjecture in 1991. Uh, he uses the ABC theorem, the infamous ABC theorem, and he implies this model conjecture. Uh, you might ask if this theorem is, al is already been proven by faultings, then what's the fun at looking at uh, Noam's proof? <coughs> so it turns out if, uh, okay, the, the conjecture and the proof by faultings they do not give you upper bounds on the num uh, on the height of the solution, as in how far do you have to go till you find a solution or till you find all of them. So it turns out, um, okay, in, in this paper, Elkis observes that effective ABC, in the sense that if you have constants which are effectively determined, then you can effectively compute the height bounds for uh, the model problem. You can know for sure that uh, if you have effective versions of ABC, then you can, in practice, in theory, you can you should be able to compute the height uh, bound for uh, the solutions. So that up to that height, you can search for all the solutions and then th there is nothing more to search. Okay. Don Zagier says, um, uh, notes this down as uh, follows. He says, model is as easy as ABC. <laughs> okay, so it's uh, because ABC implies model. Turns out it, it, it's a really powerful uh, conjecture, and it's, it impl ABC implies a lot of things, and one among those is actually model. Okay, let's see what ABC says. It's called Oesterlein Mazur conjecture. The ABC conjecture, what it asserts is that for any positive epsilon and for any relatively prime non-zero ABC, so that A plus B plus C is zero, what happens is that N of ABC, so N of ABC is uh, the radical of the product. It's also called the conductor. N of ABC is, so when I say bigger than, bigger than epsilon, um, okay, bigger than, bigger than height of ABC to the one minus epsilon. So this symbol over here, what that means is that it's greater than or equal to some constant, which depends on epsilon times height power one minus epsilon. So that is the meaning of this symbol. Let's see what these things are actually. Here the conductor N of ABC is like I said, it's the product over the primes where all these primes are uh, gathered from ABC, the product ABC. 
So it's the radical of the product. And the height is the maximum of the Archimedean knobs. Okay. Um, now, we would like to generalize this, uh, I mean, uh, try, try to fit this conjecture in a broader context so that it also works for number fields. So right now it looks like ABC have to be non-zero non numbers, which is cool. And then um, they have to be relatively prime. So is there some way we can eliminate this condition? Let's see. So if you have ABC as uh, some rational, non-zero rational numbers, you can redefine height and conductor. So height, you can define it to be the product over all the normalized valuations. So all places, finite and infinite, product over all the places, maximum of the norms of A, B, and C with respect to this valuation. Okay, now one thing you might uh, notice immediately is that if I substitute lambda A, lambda B, lambda C, right? if I think about H of lambda A, lambda B, lambda C, then what I get on the right hand side is that it is product max norm of lambda A and then norm of lambda B, norm of lambda C. But then norm is a multiplicative function, so the lambda can go outside. So what you would have is over here, the lambda will come out. I mean, it will be lambda norm of that, right, with respect to mu. But then if you isolate the lambda part, what you have is that product over all the valuations, lambda with respect to uh, norm of lambda with respect to that valuation. If you look at that product, it's always equal to one. That's the, the famous product formula in the number field uh, Q. In, in fact, over every number field, you have the same story, which is if you run over all the normalized valuations of a number field, then you have the product formula. What that means is that if you plug in lambda A, lambda B, lambda C, then the value doesn't change. That is what it gives us. Okay, so height, you can redefine it this way. And then the conductor of ABC, you define it to be the product over those primes where P belongs to some index set I, that index set is given as follows. So all those primes for which max of norm A, norm B, norm C is strictly bigger than min of norm A, norm B, norm C. So norm with respect to the prime, right? So uh, it's product of all those primes for which this happens. At which ABC, the max of norms, is bigger than the min of uh, norm of ABCs. And more generally, you can expect that th this value is going to change because for a number field, you have prime ideals. So instead of P, for an arbitrary number field, you would have the norm of P the absolute norm of the prime ideal. Okay, so if you redefine height and norm this way, then turns out these do not depend on uh, the scaling factor of the A plus B plus C equation. So you can multiply it by any lambda, non-zero lambda, and then height and conductor will not change, which means you can clear all the denominators and you can reduce it back to the previous case. Okay, so that's what I'm saying over here. Uh, the height and the conductor are unchanged if ABC is replaced by lambda A, lambda B, lambda C for any non-zero lambda. And that they agree with the previous definition of ABC when they are co, uh, when they are co prime integers. Okay, when, when they are co prime, you can notice one easy thing over here. Um, the norm, um, the, okay, so norm of A is going to be P power minus the valuation of A at the prime P and so on. So if um, um, so some of them will be divisible, might be divisible by a prime, but all of them cannot be divisible by, by the prime. So some terms could be negative, uh, could be less than one here, sorry, not negative, as in uh, the, the exponent could be negative. Uh, so this would be less than one, this would be less than one, this will be equal to one. So the min, uh, okay, the max will be equal to one. 
the max will be equal to one for uh, when when these things are uh, relatively prime integers. Okay, so with this new definition of height and norm, uh, height height and conductor, you have the same story. So let's go back. So uh, this e this inequality, I am labeling it as star. This fancy star. So whenever you see star in the, in the stock, I am referring to this inequality, the ABC inequality. Okay. Now ABC over a number field, over a number field K. Let's see what it looks like. So it's the same deal. The conductor is greater than greater than H of uh, the height of ABC to the one minus epsilon, but then the implied constant could now depend on the number field K itself. So it depends on epsilon and k. <coughs> so this holds for non-zero non ABC with a plus b plus c equals zero. Again, um, the height is the same as the product uh, that we have seen before for the rational numbers. It's uh, product over all the normalized valuations of max of norms of uh, a, b, and c. That's the height, and the conductor is the product over prime ideals. Uh, it's the absolute norm of those prime ideals, where at at each of these primes, the max of norm of A, B, and C should be strictly greater than the min of norm of A, B, and C. So you collect all those prime ideals, and then you multiply the norms of those ideals, and what you get. Uh, so these are finite primes, not not the infinite uh, infinite. Uh, inf infinite primes, uh, these are the finite primes. So take the product of all those norms, that is equal to the conductor. <coughs> so the general ABC over a number field K is what this slide is about. So for this height and this conductor, what you have is the conductor is at least as, uh, as big as the height power one minus epsilon. Okay, so using this conjecture, Let's see how we can go and solve the model problem. So we need a few things. Uh, of course, if everything is scale invariant, so by scale invariant, what I mean is ABC, you compute functions for ABC. It's the same as computing this, evaluating the function at lambda A, lambda B, lambda C. So if you have something like that, I, I call it scale invariant. OK, so when you have scale invariant, um, quantities, then it basically depends on only one thing, which is A by B. Because once you know A by B, you know C by B as well, because A by B plus B by B plus C by C, C by B has to be zero. So uh, this entire equation, A, B, and C, you can say they only depend on one quantity, which I call it R. So let's say R is minus A by B. Now you know that B is non-zero, A is non-zero, which means this cannot be zero well if it is zero then a is zero if it is one then what that says is a plus b is zero which means c is zero if it is infinite what that's saying what's that uh, what that's saying is b is equal to zero so none of these three is true right so that, that is the reason why we eliminate these three numbers from p1 so if you if you define r to be this ratio then you can you, you can compute the height you, you can re-express the height of uh, ABC in terms of just R, and that is H of R minus one and one minus R. Note, note that the sum of these three has to be zero. <coughs> if you take a look at the formula for the height function, <coughs> what you realize is that for the, uh, for the non-Archimedean places, when you have the product over those places, max of norm of r, norm of 1, norm of 1 minus r. But then max of norm r and norm 1 will be greater than or equal to the norm of 1 minus r. That's by the Archimedean property. So it's basically max of 1 and norm r. Except for uh, the Archimedean places, which is the, the places are infinite, you might have a, a factor which is at most two. That's because this quantity is less than or equal to twice the max of uh, 
one and norm r right so these are the local pieces that uh, i'm looking at so this is just this quantity which is the product of max one and norm r times some factor between one and two power r1 plus r2 where r1 and r2 are the number of real and complex buildings and this is just the ordinary height it's called it's the naive height right so the naive height of r times exponential of big o of one that, that is the height of abc so when, when you think about the logarithmic heights you you see that log of h of abc is equal to log of this height plus a bounded function right so up to a modulo a bounded function this logarithmic height is the same as this logarithmic height right so that that is the story of the height what about the conductor n of abc is n of r minus 1 and 1 minus r and this is the product of absolute norms of all finite primes of ok at which 1 1 over r or 1 minus r has a positive valuation in fact if you take a look at the, the case if you break it down into cases uh, well what is the condition for a prime to contribute to this uh, conductor well the max of norm of abc has to be strictly bigger than the min of norm of abc at that prime so if r has positive valuation you'll see that it, it works out if it has negative valuation even then it works out so when norm r is equal to 1 you'll realize that 1 minus r has to have a positive valuation uh, these are the only three cases uh, uh, cases of primes so either a prime will uh, uh, the prime ideal will contain r or it will contain 1 minus r or um, it will contain 1 minus uh, 1 over r so one of these three has to happen okay so i define the naive height as h of r uh, it's this so log of this and log of this they, they differ by a bounded function right uh, as in log of h of r log of h of a b c they differ by a bounded function and n of r we define it to be the conductor of the equation that's parameterized by r <coughs> okay now there, there are three kinds of primes that come within this thing so the primes at which r has positive valuation and then the primes at which one over r has positive valuation they, they are disjoint primes and then the prime set which 1 minus r has positive valuation you you can collect those primes into different boxes and then the the product of those primes or the product of the absolute norms of those primes is n0 of r n1 of r and n infinity of r so you can factorize n of r as this product n0 of r times n1 of r times n infinity of r where these these are the product of absolute norms of prime ideals containing r 1 minus r and 1 over r okay so given any rational number you can talk about h of r and n of r so that is what this uh, this was about cool any questions uh, up to up to this point no it's going great yeah okay no. if there are any question no Anyway, okay, cool. Thank you. Okay. Hey, now, can you check on the YouTube if there is any by any chance? I checked. Okay. Okay, so we have seen uh, the ABC in, in knowledge glory. Now it's time that we apply it. Okay, let's take a look at the effective ABC implies eventual firma. So what that says is if you had an effective quality, uh, quantitative version or inequality for ABC, then you can explicitly bound um, the solutions for the Fermat equation. So suppose you fix uh, N, uh, which is, you fix it to be something greater than three and let X, Y, Z be relatively prime non-zero integers satisfying X power N plus Y power N plus Z power N is zero. Right. 
you can always make sure that um, they are relatively prime because that's homogeneous. Okay. Now take A, B, C to be X power N, Y power N and Z power N. When we do that, what do we get? The conductor of A, B, C, well, what is that? It is the product of these three quantities and it's the radical of that. Well, radical of any number power N is the same as radical of that number. So it is radical of x power n, y power n, z power n, and that's equal to radical of x, y, z. But that's equal, less than equal to the product of that, uh, less than equal to the product because radical of any number is at most that number. So the conductor is less than equal to product x, y, z. And that is less than height of ABC, whole power three, uh, whole to the three by n. Why is that? Well, height is basically the maximum of x power n, y power n, and z power n. So if you take the max of those quantities and then divide it, uh, whole, you raise it to whole power 1 over n, uh, well, what, what you were looking at is max of x, norm x, or max, uh, max of norm x, norm y, norm z. So you cube that, and the, this will be strictly less than that. <coughs> OK. Now, is that a problem? How, how is this a problem? This, this contradicts ABC. So again, when, when I put star, uh, it's uh, the inequality that I'm talking, the ABC inequality. Because on the left side, you have the conductor is greater than or equal to some constant times H power 1 minus epsilon. So for large enough epsilon, okay, so... Um, what you have is h power 1 minus epsilon is less than h power 3 by n. Right? So what, that is constraining the epsilon to be such that 1 minus epsilon should be less than 3, 3 over n. Which means, you okay, 1 minus epsilon should be less than 3 over n, which means epsilon should be bigger than 1 minus 3, 3 over n. But the ABC is true for any epsilon. So if one minus three over n, well, that's some positive number. If you pick epsilon to be smaller than that, then this equation will give you a contradiction, provided h is large enough. If h is large enough, then you get a contradiction. Okay, so um, that's it. That that's the proof of uh, the eventual Fermat. Um, but then let's put this in context in in this framework. If you take a look at f, this function f, which is minus x over y to the n, so on the nth Fermat curve, uh, which I'm calling it as fn, so consider this function uh, on that curve. Turns out f is ramified only above 0, 1, and infinity. Right? And it att attains these three values at exactly n distinct points. So simple computation where you say set this quantity equal to 0, you get x is 0. So y power n plus z power n is 0 then that says 1 plus z over y whole power n is 0. Therefore, z over y has to be a root of nth root of minus 1, and there are n many choices, and so on and so forth for all the other things. OK. Um, now, f is ramified at these points, and the pre-image of these uh, points, as in f inverse of 0, f inverse of 1, f inverse of infinity, that's a small set compared to the degree of f. So degree of f is n squared. <clears throat> that's because if you want to get x over y, that's a degree n operation. And then you raise it to the power n, that's a degree n operation. You compose these two, you get a degree n square operation. OK, now it's interesting to note that this f is a Bailey function. And more importantly, h of abc is actually h of f of p. So what do I mean by that? Uh, it's h of the small r. If, if you remember that symbol, uh, that notation, h of little r and n of little r. So uh, the conductor and h are basically h of f of p and n of f of p. So you cooked up some function. We cooked up some function at which you are evaluating the height and conductor, and this function is a Bailey function. 
Okay. <coughs> For this function, if you look at the number of points over the curve, over uh, the, the Q bar, right? Algebraic closure of Q, uh, where f of p belongs to 0, 1, or infinity, the, the size of this set is, well, it is equal to 3n, right? Because the pre image over 0 is has size n, this has size n, this has size n, so this is 3n, and that is less than n squared. And that's true because n is greater than 3. Right? More generally, you can ask over a curve C of genus greater than or equal to. Uh, this is important because the Euler characteristic and all those considerations, you'll, you'll see that this quantity is uh, an important part. So over a curve C of genus greater than or equal to 2, we need a ra rational function such that the, the size of this fiber, which is fiber over 0, 1 and infinity, um, is less than the degree of f. That is one. Let's see what the benefit of doing all these things is. So we, we are looking for a function which, sat, which satisfies this property, which is the size over uh, uh, size of the fiber over zero, one, and infinity is less than the degree of f. That is one property. Well, actually, what is this quantity? It is, so uh, the fiber over zero is degree f minus b f of zero. Well, what is BF? BF is the branch number. Branch number of F at P. So M is three times degree of F minus the sum over all those points over the curve where F of P belongs to 0, 1, and infinity, the branch number at those points. Okay. This sum this sum in M is actually bounded above by the total branch number. Well, the total branch number is twice the degree of F minus the Euler characteristic of C. That, that's just the riemann Burwitz theorem. So what that says, this quantity, this summation is bounded above by twice degree of F minus chi of C. Now, <clears throat> if F is only ramified above these three points, zero, one, and infinity, what happens is, is that this sum will be equal to this total branch number because there, there is no other uh, uh, point where it's ramified, above which it's ramified. So all, all, all the uh, ramification happens only above 0, 1, 1 and infinity. If that's the case, then this quantity m has to be equal to 3 times degree of f minus the total branch number which is twice degree of f minus chi of c. Well, what is that? It is degree of f plus chi of c, and that's less than the degree of f. Right? Because chi of c is uh, 2 minus 2g, right? So 2 minus 2g will be less than the, uh, 0 because genus is at least 2. So we are looking for a function which is ramified only above 0, 1, and infinity. And then that's all, right? Because once the genus is greater than or equal to 2, Riemann Hurwitz would automatically imply that m is less than degree of f. Right? Now you might ask, does there exist functions like that? Turns out, yes. That's the real content of Bailey's theorem. A map f from C to P1, which is ramified at only 0, 1, and F, uh, 0, 1, and infinity, is guaranteed by the Bailey's theorem. Let's see what that theorem says. It says that a non singular algebraic curve C defined over a number field, so it's a curve where all the coefficients are coming from K. Now you look at the complex points of it, it represents a comp compact Riemann surface. Well, uh, this is uh, viewing it in P2, right? Only then it will be a compact Riemann surface, which is ramified covering of the Riemann sphere, ramified at only three points. Right? And if you look at the map, the covering map, the ramified covering map, that's called a Bailey function. And this function f is precisely that. The, the function that we are looking for is precisely that, that Bailey map. Okay, now. Due to the symmetry of Mobius transformations, you can pick 
the three points to be arbitrary three points, your favorite three points. So we can pick that to be zero, one, and infinity. So you can make sure if your curve is defined over a number field, then it, what it represents is a ramified covering above. I mean, there exists a, a covering map like this. Uh, it's a ramified covering over the Riemann sphere, ramified at at, uh, at only 0, 1, and infinity. So th this can always be done. That's the, the Bailey's theorem. So which means that for a curve, for this curve C, all you need is a Bailey map. Once you have that, uh, you know that it's ramified only about 0, 1, and infinity. And then that would imply that M is smaller than the degree of F. <coughs> Okay. Okay. For for this for the curve C, fix a Bailey function f of degree d. For such an f, the, this m will be less than d. I mean, we we exactly know what that will be equal to d d plus two minus two g. But all we need is is that it's less than d. Okay. Now the strategy of proof. Um, th this one slide should should say it all. Now. The, the, now, okay, for any k rational point p over the curve c, right? Not in the finite set f inverse of zero, one, and infinity. No, not not that fiber. You pick any k rational point p, then Elkis, no, Noam Elkis shows that if you look at this quantity h p, which is h of f of p, right? Consider the Bailey function uh, f. You evaluate that function, uh, that function at point P, and compute the height of that evaluated value, h of f of P, and n of f of P. Right? Look at these two quantities. Then, what he says, Elkis shows that the log of n P is less than m by d times log of h P. So logarithm, uh, logarithmic heights behave well. Logarithmic uh, well, log of np is less than m over d times log of hp plus a square root term big O of square root of log of hp plus one is plus one. okay with the implied constant and the big O constant this is effective what do I mean by effective it means that you can compute it you can give proper bounds for it uh, you can estimate it properly all of that so the implied o constant is effective and it only depends on the field k the curve c the bailey map of choice but it does not depend on p good now how is this interesting why is this interesting uh, it's interesting because here's the thing f of p itself is gives you a counter example to the abc conjecture over k why is that because uh, again um, log of np will be greater than or equal to let's put greater than or equal to on this side greater than or equal to some constant plus 1 minus epsilon times log of h log of hp so 1 minus epsilon times log of hp is less than this which is less than that and that should say that 1 minus epsilon for large enough height, 1 minus epsilon must be less than m by d. But then you're constraining epsilon to be greater than 1 minus uh, m, by, m by d. But then ABC has no constraints. For any epsilon, you, you, you should be able to, uh, you should have the same inequalities, right? Uh, the ABC inequality. So once epsilon is small enough, it, if it is smaller than one minus m over d, notice that we need m to be smaller than d, right? Uh, then this quantity is positive. So once uh, once you have this, then f of p will give you a counterexample. Of course, that will not happen for all p because uh, what you need is h p to be large enough, which means for all but finitely many p, uh, I mean, it, this would only be a counter example if there are infinitely many solutions. So if you have infinitely many solutions, then the, the larger and larger p's will eventually violate ABC. 
So that's it. That's the strategy of proof. So basically, all we have to do is show this inequality, right? Um, once once we are done with that, we we are done with the proof. Just one moment. Let me check the time. Uh, okay, we have some time. Good. You're doing quite good. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, what about the strategy? Is this okay? Uh, I mean, any questions about the strategy or uh, the plan of the proof or anything? Or if you want me to go or some slide, I can do that as well. Anyone? Oh. Anyone? Uh, yeah, so this f of p is uh, in k star, right? Which one? You're evaluating h and a that f of p. Those are in k star, right? Exactly, yeah. No, just wanted to clear, uh, confirm. Yeah, 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 k star. So uh, f of p, uh, since it's outside 0, 1, and infinity, f of p is... Uh, some nice value, right? Some good rational number. And you're computing the height of that rational number. So the, the setting, I hope, is clear to everyone. So we have a curve. You con construct a Bailey map, right? And then it's ramified only above 0, 1, and infinity. You look at, for, for a point not in this set, not in this finite set, there are only finitely many points here. So <coughs> what we're really trying to prove is there should not be infinitely many solutions. That, that is the, the real uh, thing that we are trying to prove. And we are so, sticking just to one fixed curve, right? Since the beginning. One fixed curve. Exactly. That's, one fixed yeah. curve. And we are also fixing the Bailey map. That's right. <laughs> okay. okay. Thanks. So, yeah. yeah. So, the height of that rational number, uh, f of p, and the conductor of f of p, they satisfy this inequality. And... What's cool about this inequality is that once HP is large enough, right, for a given height bound, there are only finitely many numbers in whichever number system you're looking at. So if you have a height bound, you say that uh, there are finitely many. Uh, but then, uh, okay, for epsilon smaller than 1 minus m over d, if HP is large enough, which means if there are truly infinitely many solutions, then all those large enough solutions should be counter examples to the ABC. <coughs> so that's the plan of the proof. Now, all we have to do is right now prove this inequality, right? Because we know that the function f exists by Bailey's theorem and uh, all the computations will go through. Okay, cool. This is the main theorem, Elkis. What it shows is that let C be a curve over F, uh, over K, and F is some rational function of degree D. Then for any K rational point P, which is outside the fiber over zero, we have log of N zero of F of P is less than this quantity. One minus the branch, branch number at zero divided by the degree of F, times log of HP, right? the logarithmic height, plus a square root term. <coughs> with, with the Again, with the implied constants, uh, effective and depending on K, C, and F. That's so uh, I'll convince you that once we prove this, uh, then we are done. So this is really the main proposition of the paper. I hope it's clear, uh, the statement. It might take some time to really digest the inequality, um, but then this is really the content of it. Okay. Now, if you replace f by f minus one, well, let's see what we get. We get n zero of fp minus one, right? I mean, it would be f of p minus one, n zero of that. But what is that quantity? It is precisely n one of, uh, that quantity, right? Because n0 of r minus 1 is, you want a prime to divide r minus 1, but that's exactly the prime in n1 of r. Right? So if you replace f by f minus 1, then this n0 becomes n1. What happens to this, uh, this quantity? Uh, well, you get 
one. Um, but yeah, you, you get this one. You get this quantity. And notice that if you look at the heights, they only differ by a bounded function. So things which which are the same modulo a bounded function are treated the same in, in the theory of heights, at least in the theory of logarithmic heights. Okay. <coughs> now, if you have this inequality for, well, you have n0 of something, n1 of something, n infinity of something, uh, well, they are also the same thing, right? Uh, it, the, the, the thing that's inside is f of p. Well, what is n of r, if you remember, n of r is n0 of r times n1 of r times n infinity of r. It's the product of these three um, numbers, right? So all you have to do is if you add these three equations, what's going to happen? You're, you're going to get log of n0 times n1 times n infinity, which will be log of n of f of p. And that will be less than, well, you have log of hp, that's common in all these three. And then you have a huge bracket, which is one minus the branch number of zero divided by z uh, divided by d plus one minus branch number at one divided by d plus one minus branch number at infinity divided by d. Right? When you add them up, what you get is m by d. So when you add these three terms, what you really get is this equation, this inequality. So all you have to prove is this here. Once we do this, we are good enough. Good. Okay, so adding them up, we get the inequality and that would prove it. Okay. So, uh, just uh, Anurud, so you are now going to give a sketch of the proof of this theorem, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And once we uh, understand the sketch of this proof, uh, mm -hmm. We, we'll put all the things together and then we'll see that it, uh, ABC will imply model. <coughs> ah, okay. Yeah. All right. Exactly. Thanks. Yeah. So, uh, exactly. So, once we have uh, this inequality established, which is implied by the theorem, because by just uh, based on just what I said right now. If you replace f by f minus one and f uh, one over f, you get two more inequalities like that, like this. When you add them up, you get this diamond. Okay? You get this uh, inequality. And once you have this inequality, you have a counter example to ABC, which if life is good, should not happen, uh, which means model should have only finitely many solutions. That, that's the line of implication. Okay. Adding them up, we, we are done. Okay. Um, let's understand uh, heights relative to a divisor because th there is some local computation that goes inside. Um, <clears throat> okay. So if you consider the space of all real valued functions on C of K, what is C of K? It's the K valued points on C. By the space of bounded functions on C of K, uh, I mean, it's the space of all real valued functions, modulo bounded functions, right? That's the space script H. So let H be the quotient of these two. Then you have pick the Picard group of C, which is the first cohomology of uh, C over the sheaf or C star uh, or the structure. Um, you can also say this is. Um, all the devices modulo the principal devices, right? The divisors of functions, at least for the um, locally factorial cases. But um, yeah, uh, it's all line bundles. And then it's the isomorphism classes of line bundles with the multiplication being the tense product. So that gives you a group structure on this set. And that's the Picard group of C. Since it's the first cohomology, I'll, I'll write the notation. I'll try to keep it additively. It's a commutative thing, right? <laughs> okay. Here's a small theorem. It's basically a property of uh, heights. 
Turns out there is a unique map from C, which takes C to H sub C, from the Picard group of C to this vector space H. Right. So what I'm saying, it's uh, it takes an element of the Picard group, it takes a line bundle, and gives you a, a class of real valued functions which are well defined up to a bounded function. So for each C, you have H sub C. Now there's a unique map from pick C to H, which satisfies these two properties. Okay, so H of C plus C prime is H of C plus H of C prime modulo a bounded function. So it's basically a homomorphism from pick C to H for all C and C prime in the Picard group. And Okay, if you have an element of the Picard group which corresponds to this morphism, well, what am I really talking about? <clears throat> a line bundle is classified by a map to the projective space, right? Um, now, th that's because the classifying space of all line bundles is P infinity. Uh, but if your space is compact, then the image of it will sit inside some finite projective uh, substructure. And then this has the tautological line bundle. You pull back the tautological line bundle to C. Um, yeah, and, and that would give you a, a, an element of um, the first cohomology, right? I mean, you pull back the tautological bundle, that, that, that is the um, class C. Okay, now if C corresponds to a morph morphism phi, then H sub C, which should be a bounded, which should be a real valued function, modulo a bounded function, turns out it is equal to, up to the bounded function, it is H sub phi. What is H sub phi? H sub phi is the logarithmic height of H of phi of x. <coughs> so it turns out these are the properties of, uh, this is the connection between heights and line bundles. Um, it's basically a homomorphism. And then if C corresponds to a morphism to the projective space, uh, well, think about this. Uh, phi of x is a bunch of coordinates, pro uh, projectivized coordinates, and you compute the height of that that height is well defined what you do is you take the max of norms of the coordinates and then you multiply them out okay now you add them up because we're looking at logarithmic heights <clears throat> okay we'll use uh, uh, this theorem to prove this okay the proof of the theorem and this is good news we, we are at the 13th slide so just a little more to go so suppose you have f, which is a Bailey function on C, and let d be the zero divisor of f, right? So you take the zeros, and that's the divisor uh, of f, and write d as summation over distinct irreducible divisors of, uh, I'm sorry. Okay, you break down D as sum of MK times DK, where each of these DKs has degree, uh, th these are irreducible devices of degree DK occurring with multiplicities M sub K. Okay, therefore you have D equals sum MK DK, and then the branch number of F at zero is D minus summation DK, and that is D minus degree of D prime, where D prime is the same as D, but then all these multiplicities are removed. And that's important when you compute the conductor. Okay, we have this quantity log of HP is up to a bounded function, up to a bounded uh, function. Uh, uh, these, these are really functions because the, the, the parameter that we have over here is P, right? Um, <coughs> excuse me. So, 
So log of HP is little h h sub d of p plus a bounded function. And h is a homomorphism. So you have h of d equals mk times h of dk. Right, evaluated at p. <clears throat> now, except for fin finitely many primes of k, I mean, which primes am I talking about? The, the primes that I'm talking about are the primes where you have bad reduction or if the function itself uh, vanishes after you reduce. Okay, so uh, except for finitely many primes, a prime occurs in n0 of f of p, even only if it contributes to some h d dk of p for some k. And that means that an upper bound for log of n0 of f of p is h of dk of p plus a bounded function. Right? And that is precisely h of d prime of p. Why is that? Because again, we have a homomorphism from big C to script h. So you, we have given an upper bound for log of n0 of f of p by h sub d prime of p. Now, h sub d prime of p, if you show that it is equal to degree of d prime by degree of d times h of d of p and the self function, we're done. Why is that? That's because degree of d prime is d little d minus the branch number at zero. When you substitute it over here, you have d minus branch number of zero divided by d. So that is one minus branch number of 0 divided by d times hd of p but then hd of p is basically log of hp right and then you have the quadrat uh, square root error term so if it all, all we have to show is this right and if you rearrange this you can say that um if you take this divisor delta, which is degree d times d prime minus degree d prime times d, <coughs> then what this is saying <coughs> is that h delta of p is big O of square root of uh, log of h p plus a bounded function. So this is what we want to show. But then th this actually follows from another theorem by uh, called Neron's theorem. So it turns out this divisor delta has degree zero and this uh, okay so i'll just say that this is uh, known for any degree divisor zero by a theorem of neuron um, and that's it i mean basically that uses cauchy schwartz kind of argument which is why you get the square root terms okay and that basically com uh, completes the proof and these are the references uh, this is the paper by Noam Elkis called ABC Mutualized Model. And if you want to know more about the theoretical aspects of heights um, and um, more about canonical heights or other kinds of heights, this is a really good uh, book by Ser. It's called Lectures on the Model Wealth. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your nice talk. Thank you so much. Yeah. The second difference of Cauchy about model wealth and not model theorem. It's on model wealth theorem, the second reference. It also covers a few things about Neron's theorem, uh, the Picard group, heights. Uh, so it might be how, only content to elliptic curves, model wealth theorem? Model wealth theorem. Yeah, basically that that gets into elliptical uh, elliptic curves, <laughs> uh, but there is some uh, background on model conjecture as well. In fact, I think they give a proof of model conjecture, the faulting theorem, in that book. Um, okay, uh, let me know if you have any questions about anything uh, about the strategy. Theorem, that means faulting theorem. No, uh, Faulting's theorem is uh, the model conjecture, which says uh, genus greater than or equal to two means finitely many rational points. Yeah. That, that's, 
that is mod fault is theorem and then model well theorem is about elliptic curves oh, about elliptic curves okay that's not elliptic curves uh, finitely uh, generated uh, finite groups. generation of okay. finite generation of uh, uh, those groups of uh, rational parts abc conjecture there is there again how does that write nothing no no hello Uh, I think Professor Kathre, Professor Kathre is asking what we know about ABC conjecture. Jitendra is asking what we know about ABC conjecture. Jitendra is asking what we know about ABC conjecture. Jitendra is asking what we know about ABC conjecture. Jitendra is asking what we know about ABC conjecture. Jitendra is asking what we know about ABC conjecture. Jitendra is asking what we know about ABC conjecture. Jitendra is asking what we know about ABC conjecture. Jitendra is asking what we know about ABC conjecture. Jitendra is asking what we know about ABC conjecture. Jitendra is asking what we know about ABC conjecture. Jitendra is asking what we know about ABC conjecture. Jitendra is asking what we know about ABC conjecture. Jitendra is asking what we know about ABC conjecture. Jitendra is asking what we know about ABC conjecture. Jitendra is asking what we know about ABC conjecture. Jitendra is asking what we know about ABC conjecture. Jitendra is asking what we know about ABC conjecture. Jitendra is asking what we know about ABC conjecture. Jitendra is asking what we know but then uh, i don't know with uh, some dispute uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah with some dispute so it's not all clear that the proof is ready or uh, i i think there are some upper bounds uh, like uh, but all of them are way too big uh, uh, i mean the height is given as a is bounded by the conductor but a, a function of that conductor it's exponential and uh, has all kinds of things when that's not really an effective but i mean it's effective but then it's nowhere close to um, the abc's uh, 1 minus epsilon bond or even instead of 1 minus epsilon if even if you plug in kappa minus epsilon where kappa is smaller than 1 even th that is unknown so nothing really is known in that territory but then it seems to imply a lot of big theorems um and there seems to be some craze behind it <laughs> of course over the fu function field context probably makes more uh, geometric sense but uh, over number fields it's mm. not clear uh, okay thank you nice lecture thank you thank you so much thanks <laughs> thanks that's uh, uh, just a question how is this you, can you please recall again the relationship of the Uh, size of the fibers and the uh, height, height and the conductor. Okay, uh, so let's see. Uh, size of the fiber at M. Yeah. So uh, what we wanted was we wanted M to be smaller than D. Smaller than the degree of uh, d. That was ensured by uh, does, this does, expression. Does, does every Bailey function satisfy this? I mean, um, it does. It, at least it satisfies this like, uh, bound. But then, when genus is bigger than bigger than equal to two, this becomes smaller than d. So it does. It does. Every Bailey function satisfies this. Okay. Yeah. and if for for the uh, eventual fama setting the height of abc is actually height of f of p and it's really the same uh, kind of argument where where f is this map and this also turns out to be a bailey function this, the, the the d is the degree of f right d is the degree of f so that so, but the then the size of the fiber it just the Uh, that's always less than or equal to d. So that's true. But then you have d points. If something is ramified, then it's less than d. Right, right. But then we are adding up all that information at three different points. So that might shoot up, but then it should not. Well, each of these, like you said, it is d minus the branch number for zero, for one, and infinity. But then, when you add them up, even then, it should be smaller than degree of f. I see. I see. So, in, in this case, we have n plus n plus n over zero, one, and infinity. N plus n plus n smaller than n square, and that that's because n is bigger than three. so for any bailey map uh, uh, this happens and that's a really good thing okay um that's it i guess any other question yeah. no i think thanks anirudh yeah so if there are none let's thank anirudh